Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our continuing series of Newsmaker interviews featuring Dr. Marvin Olasky. Uh, today's special guest is Donna Rice Hughes. Donna is the president and CEO of Enus Enough is Enough. She's an internationally known internet safety expert, author, speaker. Enough Enough is, was uh, created in 1994 and has emerged as the national leader on the front lines to make the internet safer for children and families. Since then, EEI, I should just do O McDonald, E I E I O, E I E I, yeah, yeah, okay. E I E has pioneered efforts to confront online pornography, child pornography, child stalking, all a bunch of bad stuff about that. And um, she's trying to her best to make our families and our kids safe from the predators that are lurking on the internet. She published a book in 1998 called Kids Online, Protecting Your Children in Cyberspace. She speaks about this all over the world. She is on television regularly, on the Today Show, on Dateline, the O'Reilly Factor, Oprah. How'd that work out? Was that okay? All right, good. On 2020, she's done 3,500 media interviews. She's testified before Congress, before government commissions, and has served on the Attorney General's Internet Safety Task Force and the Internet Safety Technical Task Force created by and formed by the U.S. Attorney General. She has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of South Carolina, the other USC, and gradu graduated magna cum laude in Phi Beta Kappa. She's married to Jack Hughes, has two grown stepchildren, three grandchildren, and she has a testimony. And it's a testimony I've heard before, and it's a testimony that tells us that uh, the central truth of the, of the Christian life is Jesus forgives sin and gives us second chances. So we welcome to our campus Donna Rice Hughes. Donna, welcome. So Donna, you were a very good student, yes, biology major, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. When you graduated in 1980, did you know what you wanted to do next? I, I really was not sure. In fact, I was um, one of those undecided majors. I don't know if we have any here, but I was told on my junior year that I had to decide on a major because I was biology pre-med and also business, and there were no crossover courses, so I had a very loaded schedule. Um, I knew I wanted to make a difference. Um, God had given me you know, a real love of, of academics, and. Um, and, but I didn't, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, to be quite honest. Okay, so, so take us then through, say, the next seven years. I mean, starting maybe with Miss South Carolina and moving on from there. Yes, um, the year I graduated from college, um, I was Miss South Carolina in the world, Miss World Pageant, and um, was on my way to New York. And let me just go back and say that um, from middle school up through high school and college, I was very dedicated to the Lord. Um, I was very involved in youth group, the choir, was a summer missionary at the Southern Baptist, uh, through the Southern Baptist Association. And, um, and I dated Christian guys, and you know, I was kind of like, really like a poster child for, you know, good Southern Christian girl, you know. And, um, and then, uh, some things started to happen towards the end of my college career. Our pastor moved away and took really the whole church staff with them. And so our church started to fall apart. So a lot of that, that fellowship and community went away and accountability. Um, my Christian boyfriend graduated. And what I found is um, that I started making these little left turns, what I call little subtle comp compromises. And before long, I was dating some non-Christian guys, and I think, oh, it's not a real big deal, you know. And, uh, and then as soon as I graduated, I actually lost my virginity when I was date raped by one of those non-Christian guys. And I never told anybody about that. And I was on my way to New York. And that really was a catalyst um, in my life where I just went really radically prodigal for the, in, in my 20s. And so those seven years, I was living in the world. And, and it's kind of hard to believe how you can go from this, from here to here over, you know, you know, you don't go there overnight. You go there by little choices, you know, wrong choices. 
and they start out small. And so, you know, in 1987, that landed me right smack in the middle of a big international sex scandal, and you're all probably way too young to remember, but it was no fun. I was 29. And, um, and it was at that point that, you know, a lot of the things that I had put my confidence in and my trust, which was my reputation, my career, I was in the pharmaceutical business, I was doing acting and modeling and all kinds of things, um, it was just all blown out of the water. And um, yet, some of the things that I have wanted, I was offered a TV career, um, I was also offered opportunities to redeem myself and tell the truth uh, about what had happened in that situation, and millions of dollars were thrown my way in blank checks at times. I, yeah. I may need to, because again, this happened before most of, most of y'all were born, that's really uh, scary. You, yeah, yeah, it is. You're you, younger than my stepchildren. Yeah, so let me just, okay, this is 25 years ago. The front runner for the Democratic nomination uh, prep for president in 1988, this is back in 1987, is a fellow named Gary Hart, a senator from Colorado. Um, he was, uh, in a way, a bit politically like Barack Obama, and in, in he had a huge appeal to people in their 20s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of enthusiasm there. I mean, there were... Um, well, and then this is unlike Barack Obama, who who has a you know faithfulness in marriage and so forth. I mean, Gary Hart. There were rumors of extramarital affairs and so forth. Uh, Hart tells reporters to do surveillance of him. He kind of dares them, say, you know, you you there are all these rumors going around. Follow me, watch me. Well, and a couple of reporters from the Miami Herald take the dare. Uh, they stake out his uh, his Washington townhouse, and they see you coming out in the morning. And everything goes crazy at that point. Again, this is pre-Bill Clinton. This may seem back in the Paleolithic era as far as presidential or presidential candidate conduct, but taken very seriously, the National Enquirer, then a couple of days later, came out with a photograph. It was a famous, infamous weeks, photograph. Several weeks later. Several weeks later, mm -hmm. the infamous photograph of you sitting on Gary Hart's lap. Mm -hmm. And so tell us what you're going through at that point. So yeah, it, it was very difficult. I was, I was really thrown out to the press and um, without really any, any cover. And what was really interesting, I, I had seen this man twice, but um, all that said, um, God had really been trying to get my attention prior to that. Mm. And I always say it took an international sex scandal for, for God to get my attention because I was pretty stubborn. And um, so that's just a warning. <laughs> He, he will track you down. He will let things happen, you know, the natural consequences of our choices. But, you know, um, but he always wants to spare us that, I believe. And so during that time with, with all the choices and really just being, it was like a year and a half of hell, to tell you the truth, because the election hadn't happened. And I was, cons I was considered one of the key people in that, oddly enough. And, um, and so... You know, I said to the Lord, I, I saw everything that I had wanted in some ways, like a, my own TV show, you know, and things like that. Um, the, the chairman of CBS had seen me um, on Barbara Walters and said, do you want to do um, drama, news, daytime, nighttime, whatever, you know? And, um, and, then, and then a lot of exploitive things. And then over here was God just saying, come home. And so I went, okay. You know, it's, it's kind of now or never, never. And so I started taking baby steps back to the Lord, believing and wanting the pain that I was going through and that so many people were going through to count for something. And there were no role models mm -hmm. of women who had been in a situation like this who had made good choices where their reputations were restored and redeemed and where God had used them in a powerful way. And the only role model I had was Chuck Colson and as a man and so um so i started you know my journey back to the lord and really went underground for seven years and just disappeared yeah so so walk us through these 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 small steps okay the you're you're suddenly internationally famous or mm -hmm. infamous in that way um step by step tell us and, and these enormous temptations okay yeah. tv show this and that okay the, the 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 tv show is thrown at you how do you respond to that? Well, that was something I really wanted to do, but at the same time, another network wanted to buy my life story. Okay. And other people were trying to get me to write a book, and Time Magazine wanted me to be on their cover, and they say, we'll tell all the great things about you and restore your reputation, because I was being called names that you wouldn't even believe. 
because I just kind of went underground and I've been a model for all these old bathing suit pictures of me were popping up on the covers of magazines all over the world and you know and so there was a certain way I was being portrayed and that was really a temptation mm -hmm. and, um, and my grandmother said to me Donna if you say anything they said all we want to know is did the senator tell the truth and you've got carte blanche with us Playboy said, we'll do a Jimmy Carter interview. It's just a, an interview Q&A, and we'll start at a million dollars, and it'll go up, depending on what you're willing to say. And I just made the decision that I wasn't going to say or do anything at all, and I was just going to go quiet. Um, and so... Did and you have some counseling in making that decision, or how... Tell us exactly how you, you came to this, because this is an, an, the temptation is enormous. Yeah, well, and I had people telling me so many different things, and that was part of the drama for me um, and, and the confusion, because every advisor, and I have way too many, would all tell me different things. And, I, and it was hard to decide, it really was. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to sort through the good opportunities, like that TV show, which was really wonderful, um, with you know something that would have been exploited mm -hmm. and exploitive. I had made probably 50 television commercials by this time in my career, and yet uh, one TV commercial came up, and I thought it seemed like a good idea. It was for jeans called No Excuses, and I thought, well, I'm not making excuses. I'm not going to point the finger. So many people make choices in their life, and then they blame everybody else, right? And I don't. And I, so I thought, oh, that's. And I'm a. I'm an actress, I'm a member of the Screen Actors Guild, that seemed like a good thing. Well, you would have thought I, you know, I don't know, kicked a cat across the, the road or something. I mean, I was just lamb blasted mm -hmm. for that. So I did, at that point, I just said, you know what, no matter what I do, it's just, you know, I had, I, I had a garage sale to get rid of stuff because I had to move. And it ended up on the front page of papers all across the country. So, you know, it just every single choice seemed to have these huge ramifications because I was under this incredible scrutiny. And this wasn't in the day now. You've got a scandal a week, right? You know, we could start a new thing called Scandals Are Us and hang out a shingle. But, you know, then there weren't any. So it, the spotlight stayed on pretty hard and fast and glaring for a very long time. And so where do you go to get away from the spotlight? Well, God, God just moved me, interestingly, here, which you would have never thought. I was hidden in plain sight. I was living in the Washington, D.C. area, Northern Virginia, um, with a family. I was actually invited to the President's Prayer Breakfast, where I met the very same people who came around Chuck Colson during his trauma, okay. which I didn't know, but God led that. That was a prayer, and not only did he lead me to the kinds of people that came around Chuck Colson, he led me to the very people that came around Chuck Colson. I didn't even know their names when I prayed the prayer. So, um, so God was really actively at work. And, um, and so I lived here and I was very much underground. You know, and are you working wife. during that period? Or? I w was not able to. It was hard for me to get a job that didn't want to exploit my right. notoriety and my name. So, um, so I, you know, I just stayed really quiet. You know, I, I, I helped the, fam the family I was living with and I was just really fortunate that I didn't have a lot of expenses at the time. Okay. And I was a saver, very conservative, by the way. And, uh, and so during the days, then, what are you doing? I mean, you're not working at that point. You're with this family. You're, you're in a sense, hiding out, I guess. And well, no. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm, working th I'm working through a lot of issues. I'm helping right. a lady that she's disabled. Okay. And so I was really taking care of her. Okay. Yep. And then God led you to a husband. Mm -hmm. God led you to your husband. So, yeah, eventually I moved to California. I started a production company. And... Um, and the, but the guy I was dating back in Washington was here, and, and I thought, God, how can I marry this man because he's in Washington, and I'm a political leper, and I don't want to be involved in the media or politics or anything else. And it was like God said, just trust me. So I, I, I moved back here to plan to get married and met the lady who was running this organization called Enough is Enough. And it was the first real job opportunity I'd been offered um, as their communications director that really took advantage of my skills and, and wasn't trying to exploit me in any way. So, um, and at the time they were dealing with pornography and print and broadcast. And I thought, oh Lord, you know, gone from one sexual controversy to a sexually controversial topic. Like, what are you thinking? You know, God's got such an amazing sense of humor. And, um, but I, I knew it was the right thing because when Dee was interviewing me, what this, she is, this is Dee Jepson? Yeah. The wife Dee, of the senator at that right, point? Wife of the senator um, at the time. And um, she was talking to me about the harms of pornography. 
and um, which I didn't, I actually thought it was probably okay, and um, I didn't really, you know, think much about it. And, uh, but one of the things she says is that among the harms is that it can promote what is called the rape myth. I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, that when it makes men think that when a woman says no, she really means yes and wants to be, you know, taken advantage of in that way. And when the way she said it and the words she said was exactly what that, that man had said to me when I was 21 and lost my virginity. And I knew right there that this is what I was supposed to do. And then within two weeks of taking the job, um, I had been, you know, very familiar with ARPANET, which was the pre-runner, precursor for the internet. And we started to see the beginnings of sexual predators and pornographers using bulletin board services and news groups. This was prior to the World Wide Web even being developed um, to, to talk about abusing children using this technology. There was the hardest core pornography that we had ever seen being sold and marketed on these news groups. Everything from incest to bestiality, child pornography. And we're like, holy cow, this is awful. And so, and, and I knew, you know, but I had to take that leap of faith first to take the job. And then I went, I said, okay, this internet and protecting kids on the internet and getting in front of this problem. And I had this big media platform because everybody in the media had been wanting to talk to me for seven years. Mm -hmm. So I started calling everybody, guess what? I'm ready, you know? And, um, and they, they said, well, what do you want to talk about? Barbara Walters, you know? I said, well, what, what is it? And I said, well, you know, I started talking about the internet and how the pornographers were using this and predators. And, and she went to her producers and, and she came back. She said, Don, well, first of all, she said, what's the internet? Okay. <laughs> and what are you talking about? And then she came back and she says, I can't say pornography on national television. They won't let me. So that's kind of where, where we began. So we worked with Congress and, um, and and went to Congress, you know, showed them what was out there. We had a big briefing on Capitol Hill, and God puts us back on the horse that throws us so often, right? So here I am now, Donna Rice Hughes. I wear a little navy suit and have my hair pulled back in a ponytail. Nobody recognizes me as the same person, and all the media's there. I'm sitting next to now a new presidential candidate, Bob Dole. Okay. He's sitting next to me. He's our keynote. Doesn't have a clue, you know, I'm the same person. And... Um, and the, we blew, blew this thing out of the water in 1995 in June, and three days later, the Communications Decency Act passed. And we helped get that passed, and that was the law that, that basically said that um, pornography should be treated the same way as it is in um, print. Pornography? Pornography, yeah. Anywhere, are you saying? Or yeah, pornography, you know, uh, and, and so, yeah, so this, we're not going to talk about those laws because there were another law since then. But that law got passed, went to the Supreme Court, and was struck down. Then we went at it again with Congress on another piece of legislation. Well, okay, so, so tell us then about what Congress is doing, what the Supreme Court is doing. Give mm -hmm. a, if you can give us a, you know, a, 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 a two-minute education in pornography law at present. Yes, Pornography 101. This is actually in our film series we just did this airing on PBS that we'll tell you about. But... Um, Basically, as you know, um, kids, minor kids under the age of 17 or 18 cannot get any type of pornography in print and broadcast, right? Okay, soft core or hard core material because there are laws in print that are called the indecency laws, or I'm sorry, the harmful to minors laws, and there are laws on broadcast that are called the indecency laws. So on the internet, this particular legislation used um, one of those laws to say, okay, Adults can get this material, but consenting, uh, or but, but children cannot. And then that went to the Supreme Court and was struck down, okay, saying that it was too broad. So then we went back to Congress and we took another crack at it, narrowly tailored that law to, for the COPA Commission Act. And I was also actually on that commission, and that you know said the same thing. Look, um, we're going to do this differently. Um, we're going to ask pornographers in the business of pornography on the internet to have age verification technology. And I don't know if you all know this. How many of you have seen pornography on the internet? Accidentally. Oh, come on. Really? You've never seen any? Okay. Well, um, that's, you know, I can tell you this, that nine and 10 kids have accidentally seen pornography on the internet. Those are the stats. That's the way it is because the pornographers put free pictures and free videos and everything else on the internet. 
in order to get people to come to their site and then to get hooked into this material before they ever charge for it. So this law would have basically had age verification technology so you can't see any of that, any of that free material. And that also got struck down. So currently what we have today in this country is absolutely no regulation with respect to softer core material. The harder core material, which is any type of graphic sexual material that includes sex acts, or any of the deviant material like bestiality, group sex, and you know, rape, violence, everything else, um, that is, falls under what we call obscenity statutes. And those obscenity statutes are in place, and they have been in place since the Communications Decency Act. And that material is prosecutable for adults as well as for minor children. However, do you think those laws are being prosecuted? They're not. Okay, so it's freely available to anyone, including kids. Then there's child pornography where you actually have a child being abused, child abuse images or child pornography, which is a huge business on the internet, and kids as, a, as well as adults have free and easy access to that as well. So it's not being prosecuted, at least in part, because prosecutors tend to feel, I mean, number one, they're not gonna get any political points for it. Number two, juries are not gonna convict Right? Is that the well, juries do convict. Do, do if, do if, convict? They're, ju they're just, it, it just hasn't been a priority. Yeah. We've been working um, at Enough is Enough and a lot of other groups that you've probably heard of, like FRC and you know Focus on the Family and, and others, um, to try to get these laws enforced. And um, we have not had many attorney generals who have made this a priority. Um, Ashcroft did make it a priority. Um, however, you know, he got into office and then, you know, 9-11 and, you know, everything else. So it just really has not been a, a strong priority. So, so sex trafficking now and the battle against sex trafficking, mm -hmm. I mean, is a strong priority for lots of people, including lots of college students, mm -hmm. including students right here at Patrick Henry College. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a hot topic in a way. Pornography, I mean, I've got to say it probably is a, is a cold topic right now as far as the interest of lots of people. So is there a connection between these two at all? Yeah, there's, um, there's actually a lot of connections. It's amazing how uh, the, the harms of pornography and how it really is. Um, we're living in a pornographic, or porno, kind of a pornified society, if mm -hmm. you will. I mean, there's just sexual, sexual material everywhere. And, um, but there is a strong link to trafficking. And um, in a lot of ways, number one, it fuels the trafficking business. A lot of the material that's out there I mentioned is very deviant and is violent at times and there's things like bestiality and, and that kind of stuff. And, um, and so when that material is out there and someone gets a, hooked on it and addicted to it and they want to then you know, have sexual you know, experiences like what they're seeing in the pornography, it's hard to get, you know, a consenting adult to do some of this stuff. So a lot of, um, of what you see then are these very, you know, deviant kinds of fetish sexual behaviors um, where these men typically, you know, will use someone who's been trafficked. Um, uh, that's, that's one thing. A lot of, most anyone who's been trafficked is, is appearing in pornography, whether they're children or women or, or young boys, uh, teenage boys, you know, are all, in, anytime there's sexual abuse, there, there is video and photographs of that abuse, and then it's put on the internet, and then that just fuels more and more, uh, you know, of the behavior. So it really is kind of like a vicious cycle. But there are a lot of other harms, you know, of pornography as well. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, a, lo so a, lot of, a lot of folks, I mean, they'll say, sure, uh, I'm against something involving children. Yeah. But as far as adults, these are consenting adults, let's say. It's a private matter. It's a personal matter. So why is it a public matter? There is a, a really amazing study that came out a couple of years ago. The Witherspoon Institute put this together. And they got um, academics and psychologists and whatnot from kind of all you know, segments and factors from liberals to conservatives and everything else. And they came up with, with a whole list of what it was called the social cost of pornography. And, you know, they, they gathered all the evidence of, of the harms against men um, and women from the addiction standpoint um, against children and how this fuels sexual abuse. 
Um, there's, there's also a lot of, of, of new information now, well new, you know, 10, 15 years, of children um, acting out what they see and there's been a rise in sex crimes by children against other children imitating exactly what they've seen in pornography, acting out. Um, I think that the brain science that has come out now about, the, about how this impacts the chemicals in your brain and actually these images get so imprinted that oftentimes it's very hard to, to get them out of your mind and to experience any type of sexual satisfaction without that material, either using it or conjuring it up in the mind. And I was just Googling, um, a, 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 you can do this yourself, uh, last night I Googled um, pornography and, um, and sexual dysfunction. And you wouldn't believe all the articles that came out. And there's now a whole epidemic of young men um, who are needing to use Viagra because they, they, they are having trouble relating to their wife or their partner um, without the use of pornography because, because of the, 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 the power. And, and it's not just a guy thing. Uh, young, young women and girls are using this as well. It's very big in, in high school and junior high. Girls, lots of girls. I interviewed a lot of them in our film. And, um, you know, so it, it's, you know, it, it can impact um, your, your view and your attitudes about sex and then also your ability to have, you know, satisfying sexual relations, um, you know, when you're married. So, so that, you know, that's just one, you know, one other yeah. area. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Bob Dole earlier, and I guess he mm -hmm. was an ally in certain, I mean, in trying to have uh, laws against pornography, but then after his failed presidential attempt, I mean, didn't he make a commercial for Viagra? Yeah. Is that, is that, anyway, I'm just not well, I think be, his, not his go probably has that. to do with age, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, what's the connection, is there a connection between pornography and prostitution? Well, we, okay, what, what is pornography, what, what does it mean really? Um, pornea is the, is, is the original, you know, Greek word, and that, one of the meanings, if you look it up, is sexual immorality. So what pornography is, is really the graphic depiction of okay. sexual immorality. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, I mean the, the whole sex industry is, is interrelated. I mean, I think it's hard to really separate you know, one to another. We do know that a lot of the women that end up in the pornography business oftentimes will start in prostitution and then they'll grow, go into more, you know, what they think is a jazzy kind of cool career and then it goes, you know, more deviant south and then they get used up and spit out and, you know, that, 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 that's not very good. But one thing um, I also just wanted to say is sure. that, um, you know, there, there's also a big trend now with business people that are losing their job. About 40% of s people that are, are sex addicts have lose their jobs eventually. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's just one of lose those choices. Lose their jobs because? Because of, of, of their, their, their addiction. You okay. know, I, if they can't stop, they may be using the, you know, the office computers and things like that, you know, to get this material. And then, of course, you've got acting out. Predators have always used pornography. You know, one of the big issues we deal with is sexual predation, basically just protecting kids on the Internet. So we deal with cyberbullying and everything else, too. So it's not just, obviously, pornography. But... Um, Sexual predators have always used pornography in the grooming process um, to sexualize children, to, to get them sexualized, basically. Yeah. And then, of course, a predator will usually, when you know they've abused a child, they'll take photographs of that and create child pornography, and then spread that around and trade it and that kind of thing. So, you know, it just it just kind of goes on. There's also cross marketing between the adult porn business and the child porn business. I interviewed a sexual um, convicted sex offender in our, in our film series um, uh, and for three hours. And I asked him how, what happened in his life. And he had been abused, which is not unusual for a, a predator or pedophile to have been abused. But, um, but he also has started on adult pornography on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it can be highly addicting, all right? And so then, he wanted more, you know, deviant material and that kind of thing. He started to sexualize people as sex objects. And, and eventually it was, um, he got connected to child pornography through 
adult pornography sites and became fascinated with that. And then, of course, he started talking to kids on the internet and chat rooms and instant messaging. And eventually, you know, that led to child sexual abuse and he was caught and he's serving a 30 year sentence. Mm -hmm. so. so, a lot of college kids, I think, tend to look at this as an old issue. Mm. Um, and, um, and, and sometimes, you know, an issue just connected with the, with the, the political right and they don't want to be in, involved in political wars anymore and so forth. I mean, I guess, I mean, how do you, how do you counteract that tendency among college students? And then also, uh, yeah, please do tell us about Internet Safety 101, your, your kid here, which is mainly, I guess, aimed at, at parents mm -hmm. in lots of ways. But tell adults. us about these two, at adults. So tell us about these two, these two audiences in a sense. Uh, college students and then and then people adults with children well first of all with college students I don't typically talk to college students so it's great to be with you guys um, because because our focus is really trying to get the adults the parents the educators and grandparents and and, and all of those who are really responsible for protecting the innocence of children you know from the time they're born up okay. until the time they go off to college right so, um, but I will tell you this, we're talking to colleges and universities now. In fact, there is a college out in the Midwest who's using this program as um, part of their criminal justice major as a required course. And um, so I think it's important, you know, that, that, I mean, you all know, you've been brought up with this technology, right? So, um, so it's, it's great. You've got a completely amazing new world open to you, but you've got all the good and all the benefits, but you've also got all the downside and all the dangers. And so, um, what, what was my question about college students again? Yeah, well, basically, uh, okay. For <laughs> I'm these, sure I didn't answer it. Yeah, no, well, let's say for these students here, um, there are, I mean, what can they do? I mean, if they want to take this desire to fight sex trafficking and then also connected to this. I mean, what types of things can they or should they do? But again, I mean, I'm just asking that because we're audience here. Mm -hmm. But if you, wanted, if you want to talk more about what you're doing in terms of older adults and, and parents and things like that, that's fine too. No, no. Well, I, you know, I think that, um, I think it's important that your generation pick up the baton on all these issues. Um, because quite frankly, you know, it, you know, it's huge. I mean, there are cybersecurity majors now being offered at, at major universities. In fact, it's one of the few um, careers that they can't find enough professionals to fill the job positions. Wait, that there, are are, open. there are jobs there? Yes, there are. That's what I'm telling you. There are jobs in the cybersecurity mm -hmm. field. And a lot of what we deal with, and we work with corporations and everything, developing the technical tools and whatnot to help manage this wonderful wide open internet, okay? Because there's not just ramifications as far as, you know, bad people like predators and, 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 and harmful material like pornography that can impact people's lives, especially kids, as well as adults. Um, but you've got you know, uh, terrorist threats, you know, you've got all kinds of things that, that, that technology now, you know, we're looking, how do we harness it? Because when, when the internet started in the beginning, when we were all involved in this, it was, called the wild wild west so we've started to, you know to try to then go okay how can, we, how can we kind of pull this back in and and so that it's not used and exploited for all the negative detrimental ways that it, that it often is and you know we can still continue to, to see it grow and and be all the that it has been and can can continue to be so um so i think that you know that's one thing the other thing hopefully you'll all be parents someday so um, just recognizing that that we have a God-given responsibility to protect the innocence of our own children you know and you know for you women you know you you might end up marrying a guy who's had an issue with this and for you guys you might end up marrying a girl who's had issues with this okay I see it all the time you know because this is the kind of thing that and, and I'm talking about pornography in that instance um, that unlike trafficking that probably doesn't touch your world. Okay, it's a great, cool social cause and it's really important, but this touches your life. And if it hasn't yet, it will. Okay, it's, it's just, I mean, the statistics and the numbers and, the, and all the data is there. So I think it's something that I would love to see young people really, you know, latch a hold of and say, wait a minute, you know, um, 
God gave us this wonderful gift of our sexuality and it's being counterfeited and exploited and turned into something that, that is not at all what it was designed to be. And as young Christian leaders, you know, you can make a real difference on this. You know, and if you look at all, uh, so, many, the, so many of the culture issues that we're dealing with, you know, whether it's, you know, abortion, trafficking, you know, and other kinds of things, all this is really kind of tied together, really, in, in fallenness. And I think, you know, one is, you know, being a, being a light and being a, an ambassador, but also one of the things that we're commissioned to do is, as Christians is to, to, to be light in a dark world and to show what is true and real and genuine. You know, and um, and all of these things that we're talking about are really just kind of the dark side of how the enemy uses our sexuality to keep us from what God's plan is for us as individuals in our marriage and for our children, for your future children. Okay. Be a chance in just a moment for all of you parents and future parents <laughs> to ask questions. But let me just ask one more right now. Tell us about how this has all affected you spiritually over the years. In other words, you... You made you, you in in 1987. Uh, you had a big choice to make. I mean, you you could have taken your notoriety at that point and and exploited it and been exploited, but you decided through God's grace, I mean, to go in a different way. And so, tell us over the past 25 years then about your your spiritual life and and beliefs and how those have have developed during this time. Well, I was very fortunate to have a really good solid foundation. Um, and the pastor I grew up under, Dr. Ed Young, is now uh, the uh, pastor of one of the biggest churches mm -hmm. in Texas. And um, so I, you know, I've been in small groups off and on. I've been mentored by just amazing, you know, Christian leaders. And um, I married a great guy. And we're, you know, uh, have a wonderful Christian marriage. And, um, and it's always perfect. <laughs> always really it's so special no it <laughs> but um no we, we we have a great marriage and um you know i mean for us and and for me you know i i know i couldn't first of all even be in this place you know, where it's oddly enough, I was kind of Miss Scandal Queen 1987, and now I'm seen as a voice of, of decency and morality, and that's, that's, a, that's a God thing. And, and so, you know, God just kind of moves us, you know, you know through life. And, um, you know, but, 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 but what I'm learning is, you know, sometimes I think for, for me, because I'm a performance-oriented person, obviously I was, you know, an A student and everything else, you know, to get away from, you know, just trying to succeed and make a difference in the world and everything else and recognize that um, what we're really created for is to have a relationship with God and with each other, you know, and we can do all these things, but if we don't have love, we're just making a lot of noise, First Corinthians 13, and I find myself in that trap a lot, you know, and so, um, so it's just a piece of wisdom I give you, you know, you know, as you're going out and you're thinking about, okay, God, what's for me next? And how do you want to use my gifts and talents? And he does, you know, and he'll use all the, all the, your, your good choices. He'll even use the bad choices, you know, Romans 8, 28, 29, and calls all that to work together for good. And sometimes we think of what is good. Well, we think of what is our good, but God's good for us is that we're conformed to the image of his son. So, um, so I'm always looking at that because I mean I've had a blended family and that hasn't always been easy, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, and and other and other kinds of things. But you know, we're just always a work in progress. So, just one other question then: uh, uh, if you hadn't gone on those states with Gary Hart, if you hadn't become the center of an international sex scandal, in a sense, if you just continued, would you have continued? Do you think in that course? Or how, what would have happened had that had that bit of notoriety not really in, in a very painful situation? Mm -hmm. But if you hadn't had that, what do you think would have happened in your life? You know, I really don't know because prior to to, to going up to Washington when when uh, the Miami Herald followed me, I had made a deal with God. You know, I said I just need to have one more conversation with this person, and then I'm coming back to you, Lord. And well, you yeah. know, so hopefully I really would have done that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, who knows? We'll have to ask God when we get, you know, to heaven. But I, I, I don't know, and who knows, you know? Yeah. But. 
Questions? Thank you very much for coming out and, and speaking. Um, I'd just like to personally thank you, and I know a lot of others, but thank you for the work that you're doing and the organization that you work for does. Um, it's funny when we talk about pornography, it's, it's labeled as adult material and we see adult stores. There's really nothing adult about it. Right. It's probably one of the most immature habits shows lack of self-control. But you know, by the average, by the age of 11, most American, at least boys, have seen pornography. I, know mm -hmm. I was first exposed to it at a very young age. So it's, it's really not an adult issue in terms of who it right. affects and who's involved in it, which is what you were saying. Do you see, do you think that there's a lack of conversation, especially in the Christian realm, among younger males, from the fathers to the sons and the grandfathers to the grandsons, do you think there's just an unhealthy lack of conversation about this? I know it's something it's very uncomfortable to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think, <clears throat> I was just wondering what your perspective on that was, because it seems like until there's a cultural conversation about this, how are you gonna fight a $13 billion industry if yeah. you can't even talk about it? So that's, that's such a great point, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I was just meeting with some Christian leaders in Texas last week, and Josh McDowell put this group together, and we, we were looking at all of these issues, and the, they were all people that were involved in dealing with pornography in some way, shape, or form, either as therapists or, you know, um, mostly on the, on the after, you know, somebody had gotten hurt and harmed and addicted to this, whereas we're more prevention. But one of the things that came out of that, besides education, is the, the fathers, the role of the father. Um, there's a lot of data and study, by the way, all you potential future dads out there that um, the healthiness of your girls and boys sexually has to do with having a loving, strong, affirming, nurturing relationship with your children. You know, bo both boys and girls, especially as they're going through puberty and coming out the, uh, the other side. Um, and I won't spend too much time on that, but I think that's really important. In Christian circles, we see a lot of Christ parents' heads in the sand, just parents' heads in the sand in general. You know, and um, and the kids that I interviewed, you know, they all said, you know, it, it's so hard and shameful, especially if you're struggling with this or any kind of sexual brokenness. It can be anything, you know, from from this to just acting out, you know, going too far with your boyfriend, you know, getting pregnant, whatever. And um, to be able to talk about this with, with your parents and to be able to talk about it inside the church. And... Um, I mean, when you see half the pastors in the country that are struggling with internet pornography and polls that are taken, and one in five women struggling with pornography that are, are Christian women, you know, and teenagers is one of the biggest issues that they're dealing with in their lives, then, you know, this, this is a huge thing where it's being called the drug of the millennium. And so I think there needs to be more conversation you know, obviously about that. I mean, we're trying to get to the parents to say, look, you, you and your children are not immune. Uh, one, and you can use this. One of my favorite um, sayings is, if you think you can't fall into sexual immorality, you're either godlier than David, stronger than Samson, or wiser than Solomon. And I always tell parents, especially in Christian groups, I said, you're not, and neither are your kids. Okay? So we're all vulnerable because God made us a sexual creatures and the enemy knows that and he is going to go after our sexuality, you know, any which way he can. All right. And it just so happens now he's got the internet to get the hardest core material that you can't even find in triple X rated bookstores out there. And it is not adult. And I always fight that term, but I use it because that's what society says. We call it obscenity or Harmful to minors material. That those are the legal terms of art, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Here. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I had to just back up a little bit farther and look at the bigger picture. Our culture is so sexualized. Mm -hmm. And just watching um, the Super Bowl on TV, or just watching a news channel, and then we have these images of men and women gyrating on top of each other, barely clothed. Um, we're all Christians here, and we do want to impact the culture, but we don't want to go back to a Victorian standard, of course. So what are steps that we can take to portray a healthy view of the whole human being, you know, not just sexuality, but sexuality is part of the human being and is part of a good, a good culture um, for Americans. Um, and so how would that look? Well, I wish I knew, really. <laughs> um, 
you know, I think I I think it's important just to be able to step out and talk to these issues. There's so much data and research now that that if we were just again, I'll talk about the pornography issue that shows empirically, statistically, you know, uh, unrefuted evidence now of all the different harms of pornography, whether it's you know with respect to kids, women, adults, you know, whatever, to society as a whole, you know. Um, we can start to talk about that, and as you have people talking about these kinds of issues, and then, and then presenting a, a, a healthy view of uh, of sexuality, I, I think that's really important. You know, um, you know, one of the things that I found w w with us is that I was one of the first women t to be speaking about this that wasn't from the radical feminist kind of camp, and where they go, wow, and I say. I'm not a prude. Everybody kind of knows that. Just look at the you know history books, and um, and I you know and and you can like sex and, and think that this is a great thing, but when you talk about the harms of of the way it's being exploited in the culture, and you can talk about it intellectually and academically and back it up with real facts and statistics, then you're starting to be able to change people's minds. You know, um, I, I think William Wilberforce, and and I need to study him more, but. You know, he was living in a horrible time in England, and where you know, and he had two goals. One was to stop slavery, and one was to return England, which was a debauchery at the time, to a time of, uh, of where people respected each other and, and, and to have manners of all things. You know, wow. So I'm thinking if he he's probably one of the better models that I can think of. How exactly did they go about that? It took a lifetime. Yeah. Took a lifetime. We're you know when I talk about my little left turns in my life, you go from here to here. Where our culture has gone from here to way over here, just in my lifetime on these issues. You know Lucy and Desi, and you've probably heard this before. And I love Lucy. Couldn't sleep in the same bed. Okay, and now, like you said, we've got you know people gyrating on you know regular television and all, talking about all kinds of stuff on y y you know, and and that's not even the worst of it. That's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, as far as what's on the internet goes. So you know, I think one of the first things I believe is that the church, but the God says in Second Chronicles seven fourteen, He doesn't say go out and you know I'm gonna heal your land because you're going to go out and point the finger at everybody and try to fix it. He, what, he, what does he say? Do you mind know that verse? If my people who are called by my name will do what? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. So what can we do? We can humble our own selves and pray and turn from whose wicked ways? Ours then what's he going to do? He's going to hear from heaven. He's going to forgive whose sin? Our sin. And then what's he going to do? Heal our land. So it really, I think the call is a clarion call to the church and to us and to you and to me individually. And I was um, praying about this years ago before 9-11. I said, God, you know, you know, we've had all these laws struck down by the, you know, by the courts and we're doing these things. We've created this program and and this, that, and the other, but, you know, what's the answer? And he, he, he showed me that, but the verse that he used later was the one when the woman was dragged to him that was caught in the act of adultery. Because I typically would think that those who need to humble themselves and pray in this case when we're dealing with, you know, the sexual immorality in our culture would be those who were the sexually immoral or sexually broken. Isn't that what you would kind of think? Well, that's true. That's one you know, group. But then in that story, there's three other groups that, that are in that story. Mm -hmm. The first are the Pharisees that are the self-righteous ones that are throwing the stones that may or may not be guilty of the same things that they're wanting to stone the woman for, right? Then there are the, the ones who are just the apathetic passers-by that say, this doesn't impact me. I'm not going to get involved, but they're watching and they're looking, but they're not doing anything. And then there's Jesus. So he showed me in that story that if we have the, don't have his heart, if we have the heart of the Pharisee, the heart of the apathetic, or 
we're the ones that are engaged in some kind of you know sexual immorality or we're just broken and we need to come into the light and get healed of these things that that we all have a place to repent in that particular scenario and i think that we can use that for anything yeah. in our culture so i think the it's got to start with us that's a really long answer sorry yeah, but, but not pointing the fingers at others but right pointing at ourselves. right but, but in our case, what we're trying to do is help adults recognize that the children that they are responsible for, that, this, that they're up against this stuff. They're not immune. And that they've got to step in and be the first line of defense. Yeah. Just trying. Oh, you're yeah. going to market this? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Another thing you guys can do, we do have internships. By the way, we're based over in Reston, and you can, you can help us long distance, too, remotely, if you don't, can't get there. We've got to sign up at the back. But anyway, sorry. Mini all right. commercial. That's all Since right. We're doing commercials right now. Sure. Um, where's my thing here? Okay. Four-part DVD series. This is um, this is what we produce. We Public won. service announcement. Public yeah. service yeah. announcement. Um, anybody have, you know, any interest in helping us with social media, anything like that? You know, we need help. We need lots of help. Recutting things. But... Um, but this is really good. I hope that, that you'll watch it we, and go to our website and check this out. And you can just start to, you know, really spread the word about these issues. We've, we've got a lot of information and material, a lot of cool video. So do a lot of other organizations, you know, as well. But I think it's important that we make that link. So I'm sorry. I'm going to shut up. It's fine. Curriculum. Questions. More questions? Yeah, over here. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us um, on such a controversial issue. Um, and I know um, it's such a challenging issue. And the first question I was going to ask is, um, what are ways to get involved? But you kind of already answered that. Um, the other question that I have is, um, is this something, obviously, as Miriam already said, this, our culture is so sexualized. Is this something that um, the Christian culture, on average, takes serious enough, that sees as a, uh, a big enough issue? And obviously, there's a lot of shame. you know. Earlier, you asked a question, you know, who's seen it? And I didn't even raise my hand. Let me raise my hand. Um, <laughs> but um, are we taking this serious? Like, is the sense you get from the conservative Christian community, this is a big deal, or are we not dealing with it in a big enough way? I really don't think we're taking it seriously, by and large. I think you have some decency groups, and you have some of the family groups that pornography or the sexualization of the culture are part of a lot of the issues that they deal with. You know, I can tell you from a fundraising perspective, just the, the quote unquote anti-porn organizations, which we're not one, but they all had to change and broaden out what their, their missions were to include decency because they couldn't even get funding. Yeah. So, um, but now the links to violence and even domestic violence, you know, um, is really, the, the tie-in is, is huge. Again, I was just Googling yesterday. There's so much information now. We've had information overload, really. You can take any, any bit of this and, you know, and run with it. But, but no, I don't think we're taking it seriously inside the church. You know, I really don't. We talked, and this is what we talked about last week. You, you know, Josh McDowell had this whole group of pastors, and then he, he started to poll them, and they went back and came back, and he said almost all of them, realized after he had educated them that this, these issues, well, he was only dealing with pornography impacted their family. Now, they're not dealing with sexual predation or anything else, you know. You know the, the majority of kids that are in chat and IM and, and social media have been contacted or had some kind of conversation with a predator, you know. And kid, one in five kids are sexting. He, and they think it's okay. You know, and they don't even realize they're creating child pornography, which is a felony, you know. So, um, I mean, you know, even, you know, our youth are going, well, what's the big deal? Yeah. You know, and so did Anthony Weiner. Yeah. You know, well, he found out. So, you know, yeah. 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 We're here. Probably 20 years ago when I started teaching uh, con law online to high school kids, I would say I hit a libertarian viewpoint one out of every 20, 25 kids. Now it's one out of three, homeschool Christian kids. And the libertarian viewpoint is all this stuff should be legal. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the, uh, I believe one of the cr growing crises in the Christian community 
is that we're losing the consensus mm -hmm. that there's something wrong with this and that it should be illegal um, to portray, pr provide, and uh, you know, send this out on the internet or otherwise. What do you say to the Christians who are flirting with libertarianism? Well, I, well, okay. Just the legal aspects of this alone, you've got child pornography, which is not protected speech. Okay, so libertarian or otherwise, the Supreme Court says that material is not protected. The ACLU, by the way, they won't admit this because I debate them, I used to debate them a lot, um, don't much anymore, but um, they will tell you that, yeah, child pornography is not good because the child's being abused, but if you create speech, you know, like you, you're being, this kid's being abused and I take a video of that or I take a picture of that, okay, that, that behavior is wrong, but if I capture it on film, that it's now speech and it should be protected under the law. That's the ACLU's per position and maybe that's libertarian positions. I don't really know. I find that hard to believe, but because um, the ACLU won't admit it, but it's in their policies. Um, Obscenity, which is the graphic material, that is also, the Supreme Court says that is prosecutable, but there's a difference in how that's treated under the law. So that's graphic sexual material, even stuff like Debbie Does Dallas and everything could be prosecuted as obscenity. But unlike child pornography, if, if, if a prosecutor looks at that and they see a child being abused, they go, that's child pornography, that's per se illegal, it's gotta come down, okay? It's contraband. If it's obscenity, so now we're gonna take something like that's clearly obscene uh, bestiality, all right? Clearly obscene. Now, here's a picture of bestiality right here, pretend. And it can be all over the internet. There's millions and millions of images of this, by the way. Uh, don't Google it, just trust me. But um, now a prosecutor can't say that's gotta come down because that's obscene. It's clearly obscene. What the prosecutor's gotta do is take this before a court and have due process then for the court to say, okay, yes, that's obscene and it's gotta come down. So that's one of the reasons it's not being prosecuted. And there's billions of dollars of material that's obscene that's not being prosecuted. And then you've got the harmful to minors material, that is, which is more the playboy variety of, of content. And a lot of times when you say pornography, people think of that. And, and in our culture, the Supreme Court says, that is protected speech for adults over 18 or over 17, depending on the state, but it is not protected speech for minor children. But on the internet, those we tried to get that law extended to the internet and it wasn't extended. So what I always say is, well, whatever you think is what you think, but this is what the law says, okay? Um, that's one thing. As a Christian, to think that any of that material should be protected speech and should be illegal, I would call them back to the Bible and say, look, do you realize what pornography is? I mean, even if you're just using this material and watching it, you, that's voyeurism, right? And the people in the material are either there voluntarily, which means they're prostituting themselves, right? So you're using a prostitute or prostitutes, or they're there unwillingly and they're victims of trafficking or abuse or something else. So how can you say then to God, that should be okay? That's what I would say, but I'm on my soapbox right now, so. <laughs> okay. Did I answer that? Yeah. Well, it, it, the question doesn't take weeks to fully answer. You, you nailed it player one. And two. Did I? Okay, thank you. There's, yeah. Um, Okay, so I, I came a tiny bit late, so I apologize if you've addressed this somewhat already, but um, in terms of things like child pornography, which are illegal, and which are obviously huge, huge industries nowadays, w would you say there's any connection between, I guess, the, the punishment for people who are caught and how big the industry is? Like, for instance, like, oh, I'll only serve this many years in jail, or oh, it's not actually enforced, I'll never get caught, or something like along those lines. Like, is it that, like, the, the risk of the risk of doing it and getting caught is not big enough so that it's such a big industry or something along those lines. And what kind of pornography are you talking about? Um, child pornography. Child or, pornography. I mean, any, anything that, I mean, any of the stuff that's illegal, basically. Yeah, well, the, 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 the prosecutable illegal obscenity is really not being prosecuted, but when it is, there are usually just fines associated with that. 
but I can tell you with every new attorney general we had up until just recently, um, the, the pornographers, the hardcore pornographers, would go to the um, attorney generals of the United States, because I work with these people, one of these guys is on my board now, um, and say, so, are you going to prosecute obscenity? Because they know exactly where to pull the line back to, so they don't get prosecuted. They know exactly what that line is. And not to be gross or anything, but we used to call it PCV, which is penetration clearly visible. So they know the line, they know what can get prosecuted, okay? Um, it hasn't, no, nothing's happened on that front. So with child pornography, um, it, we need to have more standardized uh, sentencing laws because if the, what the law says is that if you possess, well, actually, if you distribute, host on a server or possess child pornography, you're guilty of the felony, okay? So, but the sentencing laws are different, okay, in different states. And sometimes there's a slap on the wrist, and sometimes, you know, they can, you know, get, get fines. Other times they can go to prison, all right? Um, so, so I, I, you know, you know, I think that we need to have stronger stronger laws about that and stronger stronger penalties definitely but that that goes to the issue of the penalties with s sexual predators the 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 guy who abused the girl that, that we interviewed in our film series alicia she was um had an on a nine month chat room or relationship with a guy that she voluntarily went to meet he took her to virginia um and kept her as a, a sex slave for four days with a chained collar to her neck. Her whole story's on our website and in here. Um, and he, he videotaped the abuse and posted it on the internet. Somebody, one of the pedophiles who was watching this, um, knew that she was gonna get killed eventually and called the FBI and she was rescued. Now he only got like 20 years, okay? And he was a sadistic pedophile. Um, the guy that I interviewed who was a sexual offender was 25 years old when he was caught he had um, had what was quote unquote more the norm in these kinds of cases online where the, the person that he was interacting with, the teenager, was a 14 year old boy, willingly met with him and they had a quote unquote consenting relationship. The 14 year old boy and at the time a 21 year old boy or young man. He got 35 plus years, you know, and so there's you know, there's a lot of discrepancy, you know, if you will. And then you've got sex offenders that are out there that have actually abused a child. And by the way, the Sandusky trial, you want to get involved in something, um, you go to our site, which sent out a newsletter today. They're sentencing him starting this week uh, or next week, I think. Um, we hope, you know, he really gets the law thrown at him really hard and heavy because those kinds of public cases do send uh, a really loud you know, uh, voice, um, but, oh gosh, what was I gonna say? Uh, where was I? Um, laws and Oh, yeah, the, okay. Um, I completely had a brain burp. It just went <laughs> somewhere. It's out there and maybe it's over there. Can you grab <laughs> that thought and bring it back? <laughs> I completely <laughs> forgot, was it? What was it? Yeah, if you want to get involved, yeah, in the Sandusky thing, but. Well, yeah, it's not, but okay, I can't remember. Maybe it'll come to me. We're, Sorry we're about that, guys. We've been going for an hour. It's, it's, okay. Uh, yeah, Michael. We, not a uh, great way to end this. It though. isn't, but it's, it, it'll, be, it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, tackling uh, a really tough issue. Uh, it's something that I got involved with in early part of my career. I, I wrote Washington State's anti-obscenity law. It went to the Supreme Court. One word of it was declared unconstitutional. The word mm -hmm. lasciviousness was stricken from the definition of period interest. Or, I mean, actually, the word lust was stricken and left the word lascivious, which means lust, which, <laughs> which means it's unconstitutional to use short words. That was the net message uh, I thought of, of that I thought. case. So uh, this is something that harms everybody. Yeah. It harms our society. It degrades our society. And um, that's, if we want to live in an uplifted society, we need to 
be standing up for what's right in these areas. So thank you so much for taking on a thankless task, a very tough task, and doing it with such grace. We really appreciate you being thank here. And Marvin, you. thank you so much for a week of fantastic interviews. We really appreciate thank you. you. Thank you very much. So I'll join him and give him a hand.